Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Humanity must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Humanity will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The Lord is my portion, therefore will I hope in Him. Holy and gracious God, I speak in your name and in your presence, asking that my words would be pleasing to you, guided by your Spirit and that the hearts and minds of your people would be open to you. Through Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, so our gospel passage this morning has two of what might be called the hard sayings of Jesus. One of them... He looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. And, and by the way, this text is full of hard stuff, but I'm just focusing on two of them. The second one is, if anyone want to become my follower, let them deny their self and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, that is the good news of God, they will save it. So, this story is actually a hinge in Mark's gospel. Much has been happening that leads up to it. And, and this story is part of several stories that forms this turning point in Mark's story, this hinge. And everything after this is different in Mark's story. And so, it's a, it's a very poignant moment. First of all, it's the first of Jesus' predictions of his passion. He does this three times in Mark's Gospel. This is the first one. And I want to I help us zone in on what's going on and then see if we can open it up a little bit to make it more accessible to us. First of all, when Jesus looks at Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. I mean, those are dramatic words. I want to point out that the very next story, Jesus invites Peter, James, and John to go up the mountain with him, and that's the story of the transfiguration. A very special moment for Peter. So not, and nothing about this is Jesus rejecting Peter. It's important to grasp that. Peter remains his close disciple. Secondly, Peter, he, he does not understand what's going on. And the level of his understanding places him in league, so to speak, with the Satan who is against God's purposes. But Peter does not understand that. 
And so interestingly, when Jesus says, he began to tell them that the Son of Humanity must suffer and be killed, Peter doesn't hear that he's going to rise. He doesn't hear it. Or, if he hears it with his ears, he doesn't comprehend it. And in Mark's story, that's because the Satan has kept humanity from understanding the ways of God. Secondly, when Jesus says, if anyone wants to come after me, they must deny their self and take up their cross and follow me. For all who would seek to save their life will lose it, but all who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will find it or will save it. How many of you hear the last part? Doesn't the first part cause you to gulp? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to give up my life. I don't want to take up my cross. I don't want to lose my life. Yes? And we just go, oh. <laughs> I've got a close friend, and every time we start talking about Jesus in his life, he said, it's going to be painful. <laughs> He's going to ask me something I don't want to do. Right? That's what happens to us. And so that's really the crux of this. I'm, I'm slow to say this because I think we'll misunderstand it, but I want to help us a little bit, so I'm going I'm to throw in another piece for us. A few chapters later, Jesus and Peter are in a conversation about following Jesus. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Oh, Peter, all those who have given up houses and sisters and brothers and mothers and children and fields, which we might translate as businesses, all those who have given up those things to follow me will get them back a hundredfold in this life. And in the age to come, eternal life. Now, the reason I'm slow to say that is because <laughs> we'll jump to that rather than the lose your life part first. And the, and the real heart of the story is that only to the degree we let go of our life will we see. That's the real heart. The willingness to give our life over. To actually give my life for following Jesus and give my life for the good news of God. Only to the degree I'm willing to do that will my eyes start to open, my ears start to unstop, my mind start to understand, and my heart becomes softened. It's just, I'm terrified. I don't want to lose my life. And I, even if I say in principle I do, when it starts off and something gets asked of me, I say, I didn't know what meant that. So I want to back us up a little bit now. Remember I said I want to focus in and then I want to back up a little bit. We can actually back up to the beginning of Mark's gospel, but you don't want me to do that to you again, so I'm not going to do that. We're in, we're in chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. I want to go back to the beginning of chapter 8. The crowds have been following Jesus for days, and they're hungry. And so Jesus strikes up a conversation with the disciples and says, well, they're, they're hungry, I have compassion for them, but if I send them home now, they'll get weary on the way. Some of them have come from a long distance. We need to feed them. And the disciples say, well, Lord, all we have is seven loaves. And they give up the seven loaves to Jesus. And then this wonderful thing happens. This is the structure of our liturgy. Our Eucharistic liturgy comes from this text. Jesus took the bread, blessed the bread, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples to distribute. 4,000 people were fed. 12 basketfuls were left over. He took he blessed, he broke, he gave. That's our Eucharistic liturgy. And it's the way of life in Jesus. 
He will take our life, bless our life, break it, and then distribute it for the life of the world. And it will be far more than we could ever have imagined. Which is the story of the cross. Jesus gives his life for the redemption of the whole world. But in Peter's fear, he could not see that. And in our fear, we can't see that that's what God will do with our lives. We're confident we have a better plan for our life. And we don't want to give it over to God. So this, this feeding miracle happens. 4,000 are fed. Immediately following that, the religious leaders complain to Jesus or come to him and say, what sign do you give us that you are the Messiah. Really? Really? <laughs> this sign wasn't good enough for you. It's great irony. And, and even in the Old Testament tradition, the Messiah would be like Moses and the people receive the manna from heaven. Jesus has fed them. It's not just any old sign. It's one you would think they would recognize. But they don't. So then they, Jesus and the disciples get into a boat to cross over to the sea. And the disciples have forgotten to bring bread. So Jesus is in a deeper place. And he looks at them and says, Be leery of the leaven of the religious leaders. And the disciples start looking at each other and said, Oh, he's upset with us because we forgot to bring bread. Oh no, we're in trouble. And Jesus goes, Really? <laughs> do, do you not remember that, that there's plenty of bread? Do you not remember the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000 and there was also before this a feeding of 5,000? Do you not remember? How is it you don't understand that I'm talking about the teaching of those leaders? How can you not understand that? And then these are the powerful words. Do you see and not see? Do you hear and not hear? Do you not understand? Are your hearts hardened? And Mark's story has prepared us for this so that we know, yes, their hearts are hardened. That is the human situation. The Satan has blinded our eyes and closed our ears and shut down our brain, our mind, and hardened our hearts, and we just can't see. That if we would give our lives over to the good news of God, there's an overflowing abundance. Not just enough to feed the 4,000, but 12 basketfuls left over. So, the very next story, still chapter 8, the very next story is what's called the two-touch miracle. It's the only such story in all the Gospels. There's a blind man of all things coming asking to be healed. Jesus touches him and prays for him. Actually, it doesn't actually say he prays. It just says he touches him and then says, do you see? And the guy says, well, I see men like trees walking. And then Jesus touches him again and he sees plainly. And that's this marvelous metaphor of the human situation. Peter sees a little bit, but not enough. We see a little bit, but not enough. It's like we need, frankly, many touches to keep opening us and setting us free from the Satan who has blinded our eyes and closed our ears and shut down our brains and hardened our hearts. So, it's, I love the two-touch miracle. Because I wake up every morning and say, Jesus, you're going to touch me again? <laughs> I need it, babe. I need it. I need it. Right? Immediately following that is when Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say I am? And they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Some say you're Elijah, who's predicted will return. Some say you're the prophet that's been predicted. And then Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. So he sees Immediately following that is when Jesus says, I must tell you that the Son of Humanity will suffer and will die and will rise. And Peter, out of his fear, says, Not you, Lord. 
That brings us right to our text. And the crux of the matter. We are afraid. When the disciples got into the boat and Jesus says, be leery of the teaching of the religious people, the leaven of the religious people. Their, their fear of, oh, he's unhappy with us because we forgot to bring bread, keeps them from hearing. And, and Jesus, Peter, Peter sees that Jesus is the Messiah, but then when Jesus says, this is the way of God, Peter is afraid and he says, no, 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 no. He doesn't hear that he will rise. And so, at the heart of it, is that we believe and don't believe. We, we give up our fear and then it comes back. The Satan, the adversary of God's purposes, just has us shut down. And the way of opening our eyes and opening our ears and opening our understanding and softening our hearts is to give away our lives. And and again, I mean, just look in the mirror and say, okay, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Maybe. It's so hard, and it's so hard to trust it will be all right. And it's almost never our plan. God's plan almost always is different than my plan. And God's idea of success is almost always different than my idea of success. You know, I... I've got projects and plans and I've set my hand to the plow and we're on the course and I know what I want and turns out God's often after a profounder thing. And then the truth is I'm just afraid. I am afraid. I am afraid. I am afraid. And that's the gift of this text. Could I acknowledge that the Satan has me convinced it will not be all right? Whatever it is, it will not be all right. I am afraid. And then I try to m control it, possess it, make it happen according to my plan. Rather than just this continual giving it over and trusting Jesus will take my life, my best efforts, Bless them, break them, and distribute it for the life of the world. Would I trust that if I actually give him my life, I will find my life? And what actually happens is that becomes, in Mark's gospel, the way. The disciples are now with Jesus on the way to Jesus' cross. And it becomes the way of the disciples continually being invited to give their lives to follow him and to give their lives for the good news of God. Would you just pause with me? Take a breath. You know, I, I, I don't know. I suspect in each of us there's this chance for but and if and I don't understand and what would that mean and, and, I, and I am afraid and I am anxious and I have this life with all this stuff going on. What does it mean to give it to you? Do we have the faith to find out? Amen.